For countless centuries, human security has been lodged in the local community. In the modern era, the security has been a certainty. On the one hand, by the birth of the nation state, on the other, by the emergence and institution of a newly privatized and uniquely isolated modern lifestyle. There's no need to bore you with the philosophical history of the self. Suffice to say, the notion of the self is a luxury and a fairly newfangled one of that. It took humanity quite some time to discover that each had a separate and distinct consciousness. And sometime after that, the dive met first into our obsession with that individual consciousness. Up until the time of the enclosure movement, all for one and one for all was the prevailing theory of safety and productivity, the well-being of the community, and the expression of the common will to the precedence over the needs of the individual. You play props while I catch a fish, while you build a new hot well, you fear for the offspring until they're open up the harvest. Concordance! The old work of faith, both ways, and the future. For that reason, personal achievement was barely recognized as man himself. Rather, personal status was measured by his or her contribution to the common wheel. But sometime in the Middle Ages, the more civilized folks in the more civilized countries had become self-sufficient enough to pay a little attention to the cultivation of their family and to gather their personal rewards. I no longer need you to care for my crops, that's what John Harvester down the road does. I no longer need you to catch a fish for me, that's what John Fishmonger does. Well, we're not going to eat with you anymore. My family is rich, we have a table of our own, and a fire of our own, and we'll eat our fresh fish sticks in the seclusion of our own home, thank you very much! The segregation of children and their families from the larger community and the increasing interiorization of social life drew more attention away from the community and on to the individual. The chair made its debut in 1490. Before that time, people sat on wooden benches and lined the walls of the great communal halls. The closest antecedent to a chair was the Sermon of the Throne, a simple seat designed for princes and kings who, by dint of their sovereign status, most closely approximated the autonomy of divine authority. It wasn't until the height the Renaissance that uniform sets of chairs came into vogue for the first time, reflecting the newly elevated status of the individual. The idea of constructing a piece of furniture to accommodate the individual human anatomy was revolutionary. If, in the new scheme of things, each man was to be truly an island unto himself, then the chair offered a visible expression of the new sensibility. Here was a constant reminder of the separation between the human people. The chair reinforced the idea of the autonomous individual to secure his private space isolated from the obligations and responsibilities of the larger community. Still, it takes two centuries for the fashion to spread beyond the palaces and the bourgeois homes to become standard issue for the common people of Europe. Some people simply prefer the communal experience of sitting together on benches, cushions, or the floor. Today, of course, we feel as if our space is being violated if someone brushes up against us in the hallway or tries to share an armrest on a plane or at the theater. Mirrors were first manufactured in large numbers around the mid 1500s. Small mirrors often accompanied the new printed books of Gutenberg and other craftsmen. Canon pocket mirrors were also used as a ornament of dress. Social historian Morris Berman reminds us of the unique nature of this innovation. In medieval days, said Berman, excessive preoccupation with personal appearance was unusual. People were not really concerned with how they appeared in the view of others. People lacked a sense of personal definition. The increasing isolation of the individual from the collective went hand-in-hand hand with the self-reflection and self-interest, both of which found adequate expression in countless hours before the reflection mirror. The quiet trinity of privacy, individual self-interest, and personal autonomy captured the spirit of the new bourgeoisie. As the modern family became the breeding ground as well as the refuge for the new sensibility, it began to hold society at a distance, to push it back beyond the steadily extending zone of private life. The word high began to appear with greater regularity in literature in the early 16th century. Self became a new all embracing prefix with words like self love, self knowledge, and self being entering the popular lexicon. The autobiographical form made its debut, self portraits came into fashion, self reflection and introspection became pastimes, and the incipient field of psychology made its first tentative stirrings around the mid 19th century. This new sense of separation and isolation spawned a novel architectural phenomenon in the late 19th century, the suburbs. The new suburban living arrangement systematically removed the home from the work life of the community and came to epitomize the notion of privacy. Families separated from the outside world by a surrounding expanse of law, the contemporary counterpart <laughs> of the medieval moat. The suburban house proved to be the ideal architectural match for the modern family. Like its occupants, it was detached from the external environment. The new ideal was no longer to be part of a close community, but to have a self-contained group. 
a private borderland walled off from the rest of the world. By this time, engineers had taken over the design of chairs and the craftsmen and the holsters, creating mechanized recliners that moved and pivoted in synchronization with the movements of the occupants. The lazy boy recliner became a visible sign of the post-World War II era, a visible sign of the secure, autonomous, middle-class man. Kneeling off the security of the whole, the constant support and social interaction of an assembled mass with one purpose in mind, survival, the suburbs, offer a far different kind of security, and ensconce the varying degrees of luxurious separation from strangers and neighbors. The sense of isolation grew ever more pronounced with the invention of air conditioning and television, both of which threw everyone further indoors and further away from the community. There are few places as desolate and lonely as a suburban street on a hot afternoon. Thanks to the inclusion and privatization of open space, the new LTU middle class found themselves separated from their neighbors by a crabgrass frontier and further isolated in their own homes from family members, each of whom staked claim to their own living space. The average working couple now spends a total of four minutes each day in meaningful conversation. Parents spend less than 30 seconds meaningfully interacting with their children. New technologies, portable computers, TiVos, iPods, cell phones, Game Boys, and the ever more omniscient and omnipresent internet allow for a further withdrawal from the common view. It is now quite possible to live an entire life segregated in a gated community with high walls, closed doors, comfortable, in a cushioned leather chair, remote control in one hand, the other on your laptop, face lit by the monitors. Safe, undisturbed, well distracted. Hello. Hi, this is Clara. I'm not actually the message.